Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a lovely day. I'm happy to be here. I like to start out our little sessions uh, weekly with talking about our So Confident program. And this month, we're very excited to be producing a classic shirt, which is a difficult pattern to find. So we are taking our Florence shirt pattern and deleting a few things, editing, as I call it, shortening it, taking out the uh, tuck that defines that particular style towards the bottom and taking off some of the bells and whistles and turning it into a really wearable, great, what I call classic shirt. This happens to be one of the kits. We are currently out of this particular kit, but we have more coming. So it's still on the website and you are still able to um, order that. We have another kit option, which is really unique. This is the base fabric for the shirt, which is a Bargello type pattern in teal and burgundy and a neutral color. And then we're combining it as the, for trim with this fabric. And I wanna talk about this because it's interesting when you're looking for something to use as a trim, you can't get too hung up about what the actual motif is because the largest piece that's gonna show is about an inch and a half wide. So you wanna take whatever you find in your stash or what we did to find this particular trim fabric and actually look at it in a different way. So this particular fabric has teapots and chairs and pots and plants, but none of that is gonna be evident when it's turned and shown just as a strip of color. So, see if I can do this. This is kind of what that will look like as the front band, the undercuff, under collar, stand, what else? I guess that's it. So uh, check that out because that particular kit is on our website. We have somewhat limited uh, numbers of those. But as I said, we are getting more of this kit. It's gonna be three weeks or so. So you have to be patient if you really, really want that kit. And the other kit that we first introduced, which is a white background with small uh, Asian motifs, that is sold out and we are not getting more of that one. So join us for the monthly online class, uh, order a kit and get ready to make a classic shirt. We are still promoting our Cleveland Knit Workshop, November 7th through 11th in Cleveland, Ohio. And it's a knit workshop. We're working on the fitting and production of ETs and Helix pants, but we're also opening it up to making other things in knits if you choose to do that, including maybe what I'm gonna talk about later today. So be sure and check that out. I think we have a couple of spaces left and we'd love to see you there in Cleveland. We also have our Alabama Channon event happening in October, October 12th. Natalie Channon of Alabama Channon is coming to Topeka. We have a wonderful trunk show interview talk event with her at our local Cyrus Hotel here. Uh, it's gonna be a nice party with good food and something to drink and then you get to listen to Natalie Channon for the evening. Uh, she's doing a, a workshop the next day. That happens to be full, but you're welcome to, I'm sure, be on a wait list. That is, you sign up for that through Alabama Channon, but you sign up for the trunk show evening event through us on our website and we'd love to see you there. We don't really have a limit on how many people can come. We are renting a nice big room at the Cyrus Hotel, so we have plenty of room for anyone who wants to come. Last time on, on this um, session, I think someone asked about this particular block printed fabric, which we were using for the Riviera kits in August. I always get my months mixed up. So we don't have full four panel motifs, but we do have a lot of cuts. And the cuts include, they're everywhere from three, three and a half yards. It's a good amount of yardage. And you're gonna be able to use this pretty much in the same way. It's just a slightly different uh, configuration of order of motifs, or maybe one of the motifs is a little bit shorter than another one, but very usable. And so you want to look for that under uh, cuts because we have really quite a few of them. 
This one, for example, is missing part of one of the four motifs. So I wanted to announce that, since there had been a question about that last time. So today we're going to talk about knits, and it's one of my favorite subjects, as was proven to myself when I wrote the book called Sewing Knits from Fit to Finish. This is a pretty comprehensive book. If you don't own it, of course, I'd love for you to buy it. If you buy it from the Sewing Workshop, I will sign it for you personally. Uh, I know it is available on Amazon and other places as well. But this goes into depth of all about knits, the characteristics of the different knits. I've talked about this before, but back when I owned a retail fabric store called Threadwear, we didn't sell many knits. In fact, we had one at one point, and it was an interlock, and it was red, and that's all we had. And we weren't really talking about knits 40 years ago as much as we are talking about knits now. Everything has changed, and the uh, technology of making knits has really exploded. So this goes into the difference between jerseys and interlocks and double knits and ITYs and what that means and how uh, different they are to sew. And you get into the fitting, the basic fitting of how to add bust fullness without a dart, for example, on knits, uh, other methods of fitting knit clothing, and then all the special techniques that I know about how to tackle knits if you are afraid of them. It's funny, um, I, I was intimidated by knits because I grew up sewing on wovens, and I know there are a lot of people who still sew only wovens. On the other hand, there are people who have never sewn anything but a knit and are a little bit intimidated by sewing silk. So everybody has their own little um, kind of factor of what they like to sew. But this hopefully will take the mystery out of sewing knits. And it's a quite a nice, nice book. Uh, the retail on it is uh, $27.99. And I don't know what, yes, $27.99. So. Um, but one of my favorite patterns is the uh, olive top and the pattern actually includes the an Alex top and an olive top two completely different patterns so let me show you what they look like in the pattern this is the olive top and you can see that it has a nice scoop to the neckline it has some diagonal seaming it's asymmetric along the hem, a fairly narrow sleeve, but long. And one of its fun features is an exposed zipper. Now this is really fun because it doesn't do anything except it's a detail. It, you don't have to open it to get the garment on. It's just something that is kind of fun. So you can use a regular zipper, or if you have something that's decorative, it's time to use it. Or if you don't like the look of a regular exposed tape on a regular zipper, maybe uh, add a strip of fabric, selvage, or ribbon. That could be kind of fun too. A little strip of grain ribbon is fun. But the zipper actually has an upside down look to it in that the pull is at the bottom. And it's a top at the top of this cutout. So you see that this hemline is very asymmetric. The right back is shorter than the left back. So that's what that looks like. The other pattern that is in the pattern, and it's a printed pattern, is the Alex. And this is what the pattern looks like. Totally different, really, than the olive. The olive has a tendency to be slightly more fitted. And the Alex is fitted through the shoulders and the bust, upper back, and so forth. But then it has a lot of ease in the hips. Again, a very asymmetric hemline. I know it's hard to see this, but there are two seam lines here and here that are like an A, which is why it's sort of named what it's named. Actually, it's named for my daughter, but you know. Uh, and then it has a cowl on a fairly wide neckline. So this is a doubled piece of fabric, about six inches tall, so the piece is like 12 inches plus a couple of seam allowances, and it's a nice drapey cowl. Again, a long sleeve. 
and the back is the same shape, has a bit of easing right at the center back, nice little feature, and the rest of it is plain with no particularly extra uh, seaming. So that is the Alex. Well, both of these, in my opinion, with the long sleeves and so on, feel a bit wintry. And so to wear these kinds of garments in maybe three seasons instead of four, at least where I live, I want to uh, do some things to it. I also don't always feel like putting in a zipper in the back of the olive. I don't always have the right kind of zipper. I don't feel like going out and trying to find the right kind of zipper. So I maybe like to eliminate it. So what I've done is take the olive and I have it both on and on the dress form. And I've changed the neckline. This neckline is not a neckline that I personally really care for. It's a little bit too open for me. I don't have the greatest looking skin there and I need to uh, close that up. And I like to wear a piece of jewelry with it uh, to, to enhance the neckline. So the neckline that I like rather than this is the neckline from the swing tee. It's not like the ET, which is very uh, tall and really kind of hugs the uh, neck. This is a little bit more open, but not as dramatic as this. So I have transposed this neckline of the swing tee onto this. Are we showing this slide? Is that, let's show that. There we go, there's the front. Okay, so on the front, we start with the front. And the way you do this is you find the center front. And for both garments, that's on the fold. So you would line up the center front and line up the shoulder seam. And then you would simply trace the swing T neckline onto the olive. And you know, you can do any neckline that you want. If you have a favorite neckline on a t-shirt that you like and already make a million times, do that one. But I just happen to personally like the swing tee. But that's how you do that, is to line up the center front and then just simply trace the new shape. Now you do need to do it on the front and the back so it connects. In this case, that closes it up a little bit at the shoulder seam and it definitely raises it in the center front. Now, that does change the uh, calculation on the uh, neck binding, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, not right, this, right, not right at this moment. But it does change that. So of course, the neck binding that comes with the olive does need to be uh, recalculated and a different one put on. If you have the swing tee, and if you are putting uh, tracing the swing tee, then of course you have that neck binding piece as well that's included with the, the swing tee. So the sleeve of the olive, if you want the, the long sleeve, it does come with this nice little cut in vent. But for a shorter sleeve, I just want to literally cut it off. There's no widening, no narrowing, just cutting it off. So this is 12 inches, and then whatever the hem allowance is at the bottom, which I think is 3 quarters of an inch, maybe it's 5 eighths, I'm not really sure. Let's see what it is. I'll say 5 eighths. Uh, you would measure from the dot at the top down the center of the sleeve, and that would be 12 inches. And then you would add a 5 eighths inch hem allowance to the bottom. You would fold the pattern piece along the finished 12 inches so that you can cut the profile of each seam of the sleeve to get that little flare at the bottom so that the hem really fits nicely. But I like the length of this. It's, it's not interfering with the bending of my elbow. Of course, you can go any length that you want. Three quarter, right below the elbow, short sleeve. It could even be sleeveless. But nevertheless, choose the length that you want by standing in front of a mirror, take a tape measure from this point, drop it to where you want it, and determine what you want. And in my case, that's 12 inches. So the front is essentially the same, other than a reshaping of the neckline. But it's the back that is so different. 
whereas in the back of this, we have the exposed zipper and this cutout, and that is all gone from this. No seam, no zipper, no cutout. So here's what you do. I had to do a little thinking about this uh, because you have a left back and a right back, and you have a seam allowance on each of those pieces. And the way that the zipper is installed, the, because it's on the outside of the garment, it's not really inserted in a seam, there's a little different calculation of what is the center of that seam. So we determined that it was 3 eighths of an inch. So if you drew a line 3 eighths of an inch from each seam allowance of both the left and the right, and then overlap the two pattern pieces on that 3 eighths inch line, you would be where you need to be for the fit of the garment. Then that cut out. What do you do with that? Now, of course, you could leave it if you want. But I like the idea of just connecting the uh, hem and still keeping it asymmetric. So you take something like a hip curve, uh, a, a, uh, what's the name Veriform. of the other curve we have? Veriform. Veriform curve, something like that, some kind of a curved ruler, and just simply gently connect the two hems. So the left hem is going to be a little bit shorter, the right hem might be a little bit longer, right at that opening. But whatever shape you come up with is going to be fine. Uh, I think the graphic that we're showing you just shows sort of a gentle connection of the two sides. So that eliminates that. So simplifies it, makes it shorter, easier to make, and it gives you that variation so that you can use the same pattern many more times than just once. It doesn't have that, those signature details in the back that really say to somebody, boy, she's, she's worn that about five times, and they might be five different ones, but uh, by the time you turn it into this, you have this interesting seam line uh, here on the left-hand side and a little bit of a diagonal on the other side as well. So that is the new olive. And this is the old olive. Now you can do a similar thing on the Alex, even though it doesn't have a cutout. Um, you may want a different neckline. So a cowl is simply a neck binding wider. So use that same cowl piece. I've got this backwards here. Okay. And so this is basically the shape of the neckline. Nothing's been done to the shape of the neckline. It's not narrower, it's not shorter, it's nothing. It's the same. It just doesn't have the cowl put on it, but the cowl piece was cut down to two and a quarter inches wide. So if you think about how that uh, is calculated, you have a half an inch showing, that's about standard, a half an inch on the back side, and two seam allowances. And I think that is two and a quarter inches. We'll see, I think it is. So you just take that cowl piece and cut it shorter and you apply it like a regular neck binding. But you still have the A, you still have the shape, and again, a shorter sleeve, doing the same method that you uh, just learned with the uh, olive top. I don't know what the length of this is. It looks more like 10 inches or something like that. But whatever length is uh, right for you is good. All right. So I want to I want to talk about some. You look like you're going to say something. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to talk about some of the uh, notes that I've made that are just really the most important things about sewing with knits. I mean, the list is really very long, as you can tell from, you can write a whole book on how to sew knits. But for those of you who just want that quick approach to sewing knits, here are the things that, in my mind, are the most important things. So start with pre-washing and drying the fabric. Every knit is so different, whether it's cotton or viscose or ITYs, which are polyester generally, 
silk knits, wool knits, whatever, they all shrink differently. And so you want to, for sure, pre-wash a small sample of four inches or six inches or something like that and see what happens, whether it shrinks lengthwise, crosswise, both, whatever, and how much. But you're going to pre-wash this fabric and you're going to dry it and you're not going to baby it either. Now you might be babying the finished garment a little bit later in cold water and maybe you don't dry it, but the very first time you're going to do the most extreme thing to it to get as much of the shrinkage out of it as possible because there's nothing worse as you know than spending time on making a garment you wash it once. Well that was fun to make and fun to wear that one time so uh, do that. Um, you have to cut single layer and it's so interesting when people come to So Kansas which by the way is starting this evening uh, I, I watch people fuss and fuss and fuss about folding the fabric, trying to get the edges lined up and so forth. Well, it's impossible and it takes more time to do that than to simply lay the fabric out single layer and just flip the pattern pieces or make a second pattern piece or whatever it takes. That's going to be uh, uh, actually quicker in the long run. But the nice thing about that is you can get a little closer to straight of grain than trying to do a double layer. With, a, with most knits, you're going to see a little bit of a vertical rib or some sort of indicator of grain. And I like to take a chalk, a piece of uh, chalk like a chalkener, and I here and there throughout the width of the fabric, I like to just draw a chalk line to indicate the, what I think is the straight of grain. It's, you're never going to be perfect on a knit. I think you have to accept that fact, but you for sure are not going to be even close if you try to cut something single layer. The other thing about cutting single layer, as you see, I have a lot of prints in the background and sometimes you have motifs that just need to be worked with. This is an example. When I was cutting this fabric, I wanted the concentration of the motif to be along the bottom. I liked a little bit of uh, this motif on one sleeve. So I thought about where I placed the fabric. And I think for a lot of knits that's important, a lot of fabrics actually. But you can do that in a single layer and it's very difficult to do with double layer. I have a machine that has a built-in uh, even feed foot I actually use that all the time and if I'm having trouble with some of these lighter weight tissue weight knits then I will install a separate walking foot. I don't do that as often as I used to because my particular machine now seems to be pretty good with sewing knits but I've also purchased a five millimeter wide throat plate and that's made all the difference in the world. If you have a machine that embroiders, does some fancy stitches, you're going to have an opening that is nine millimeters and that is so wide that generally your fabric is going to get sucked down into the presser foot, I mean, excuse me, the throat plate and you're going to be digging that out and there is nothing more frustrating. I also will start my seams uh, maybe with a little piece of paper underneath between the work and the throat plate so that I can get started. Otherwise you're going to get some of the fabric kind of balled up at the uh, end and then you have these lumps that are no fun to deal with. So just a little piece of scrap tissue paper, uh, then you just start right in and you, keep, and you get to sewing right away. I think there are two things that are sort of make or break to me on sewing this. And the first is the neck binding. I don't, I don't think it matters how long you've been sewing, but it's really easy to get it wrong on a neck binding. So we're going to start first by talking about the ratio of a neck binding. So we're going to show you the, the ratio here and maybe you can take a, even a screenshot or something of it. This particular uh, document is in the Sewing Knits from Fit to, Fish, uh, Fit to Finish book. It's in a tutorial which is Sewing Fashion Knits. It's in another, any knit tutorial that we've ever done has this. Uh, and of course our particular neck bindings in our patterns are calculated in this way. But you always want the neck binding to be smaller than the neck opening. And 7 eighths is the ratio that we use. 
So if you are using one of our patterns, just use the, the piece that we have for you. But if you are ch changing the shape of the neckline, using another brand, whatever, um, you're going to have to calculate your own neck binding. So you need to measure the circumference of the neck opening. And you want to do that on the seam line. And some seam lines are 5 eighths of an inch, some are 3 eighths of an inch. You need to pay attention to that. And I use that curve runner, which I don't have in my hand right this moment, to actually measure this, the total finished circumference. So let's say that is 24 inches. You divide that by 8, come up with 3 inches, you subtract the 3 inches from the 24 inches and you come up with a length of 21 inches. You can do the same thing by calculating that times 0.875. Both ways get you the same number, which is 21 inches. So I know that 21 inches for that particular circumference, 24 inches, is going to be my length. I do not add seam allowances to this number. That's always a question that I get. I, I, but I sew only a quarter inch seam allowance. So it's like it's pre-trimmed. So when it's going to go on the neckline, it's going to be actually a half an inch smaller than 21 inches. It'll be about 20 and a half inches. Well, Alex Woodbury just showed up, I think. Yeah, in from Cleveland. <laughs> um, so do not add. I'm glad she's here because well, she has on a neck binding that she made. And I'm going to show you another one that she made. <laughs> Um, so, now I've lost my train of thought. I'm so happy to see her. Hello, right. everyone. <laughs> I'm Mike. All right. Um, so, uh, by the time that uh, neck binding is folded in half with the wrong sides together, and I actually use a piece of fusy web, our famous fusy web, cut in half, and I fuse the raw edges of that strip binding together. That is so, so, so important when you are using a jersey which curls. Some are so curly that you can't control it and they, they end up being like a little tube. So you press it flat, you put the fusy web in there, and then you have something that you can manage when you uh, end up sewing that in the round and putting it on the garment. Uh, so then um, I sew it on and I'm using uh, a pressure foot uh, that I uh, I have a pressure foot that happens to have a 3 8 inch toe on it. I like that very much. I like it. It's a wider pressure foot than my normal pressure foot. And I'm lining up the left side of my pressure foot with the fold of the binding and moving my needle position over so it's a half an inch from that outer fold. So my eye is watching the edge of the fold and the edge of the pressure foot. And that means I'll be sewing an even half an inch. And then you have choices of how to uh, finish that neckline. You can either sew a single line of stitching, and I don't sew very close anymore. I've widened that out to about an eighth of an inch, even a quarter is OK. I'll do a cover stitch, whatever. I noticed that the one that Alex made, she didn't sew it at all. She didn't top stitch it at all. It is surged on the inside, which is, I also do. And I can see that this is not now on. I'm sure this is fine. but. This is a problem in that if that seam allowance is too wide, it's going to show. And right there, it shows. I'm going to bring that a little bit more forward. So think about that when you are deciding whether to top stitch or cover stitch that or not. There's nothing wrong with not sewing something, but you need to be careful about what's going to be exposed because this, without stitching it down, is probably going to flip back up. It needs to be pressed down. So, but the big deal is I see it over and over and over that necklines are just a little bit too wavy and they're not lying flat like this one. This is really, really beautifully nice and flat. This happens to be cover stitch, which is my preference, but of course that requires a different piece of equipment or a feature on your serger and that's a whole other story. Although, by the way, we do have a cover stitching tutorial that you might want to check out. Um, I, for, I always forget to promote that. I forget that I've done it. So this is nice and flat, and this is what you're looking for. But so many of the bindings that I see on people are wavy and standing away from the body. So one of the tricks for taking care of that is to 
once you have uh, put the binding on is to put it over a ham and steam it. So I will steam it. I don't put the iron on the fabric. I just steam it and then I hand press this and mold that binding. Now that looks really good. I did not press the back and you can see that there is a little bit of ruffling. That's normal and that's what you're looking for because that will steam out. So when you finish putting the binding on the neckline, you want it to have a few minor ripples around the edges. That's your indication that there, this is gonna steam out and look good. If you don't have any ripples, your, your neck binding is probably too big. I would say that in all of the neck bindings that I've put on t-shirts, and it's been a lot of them, possibly hundreds, <laughs> I don't know, that's probably an exaggeration, but a lot. Um, I have rarely, rarely had to take this 7 8 ratio neck binding off and done something else. But if I were making this in, let's say, Ponte knit, which doesn't have a lot of give, then I'm likely, instead of cutting that binding, let's say, at 21 inches, I might have cut it at 22. But I don't know that until I've started with this, and I have to be willing to take that off and start over, cut it longer. By contrast, if I'm using a really, really tissue weight, slinky something, lacy something, something with a lot of stretch to it, then it's gonna be too big. And so I will take it off, start by cutting away an inch. I may have to take it off another time and cut away another half an inch or an inch. You just keep working it until you see this amount of rippling and then you know you're there. So that is the biggest, biggest factor in my mind for getting a good looking t-shirt. It's right here. It's where everybody is looking, you and everybody else, and you want this to look really good. The last note is that without fusy web on my hems, fusing my hems in place first before top stitching, zigzag stitching, or cover stitching, my hems are going to creep and crawl and have a little torque to them. So my hem is looking good before I ever get it to the sewing machine. So fusy web, walking foot, throat plate, steam, single layer, pre-wash, those are my top five or six things about sewing knits. All right. So I want to show you some fabrics. This is the last week of our big, big sale. We're having this summer sale. We started off with print wovens, then we did knits, and now this week we're doing printed knits. So we have a lot of different fibers up here. We have viscose, which of course is rayon. We have polyester. We have mixtures of things. All of them have lycra. All of them have the kind of stretch that you want, and all of these are t-shirt weight. It might be for the olive, it might be for the alex, it might be for any one of our t-shirts or any pattern that you may have. So let's see, we'll start here. Um, we actually have two of these, and I think we even have a third colorway. I'm showing, I think it's 10 here. We have 30 or so knits on sale. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that we have on sale. And for this next week, they're gonna be 50% off. And we're still keeping what we have from the previous couple of weeks on sale as well. The solid, um, solid wovens and the solid prints, or the woven knits. Oh, get that, all right, sorry about that. All right, so this is, these are all knits, um, lightweight, drapey. Uh, viscose is, of course, a very, very uh, drapey, beautiful fabric. Um, it's interesting, you know, we think of knits as the perfect travel fabric. Well, I have to say, viscose knits do wrinkle, and so you're not always guaranteed that you're going to be able to pull it out of your suitcase without any wrinkles, because they do wrinkle. But they do drape beautifully, and they wash beautifully on the road, and they are a great travel uh, fiber. So this is kind of a plaid, kind of a stripe. Um, I don't think there's too much to worry about about matching, but you know you could if you, you felt like it. But I like the way these are just sort of softly uh, printed. It's not a, a hard edged plaid. We have about three florals that are just gorgeous, really. Beautiful colors, beautiful, pure 
garden colors, uh, pinks and yellows and blues and whites and so forth. Uh, this is viscose, and it's funny, this feels like cotton, whereas this one feels like rayon, but this has a little, slightly heavier, cotton uh, always feels a little bit heavier, but it is viscose, so both of these are rayons. This one feels like polyester to me, but I should check it. Yes. So this is the kind of thing that obviously you can wear as a single fabric, single garment, but it's also great as trim. I don't know if you noticed on which garment was it? Uh, oh, it was, it was this actually. You know, we do a lot of uh, contrasting bindings on necklines. This is the kind of fabric that I would buy a yard of at least and have on hand to use for neck bindings, uh, for cuffs or sleeves or pieces and parts. Alex, uh, come over here real quick. Alex has on a, um, is this a Hudson? Uh, yeah, it's a Hudson. So she's used a print knit for the body of it and then two contrasting stripes for the sleeves. Well, this is the kind of fabric. Oh yeah, different, yeah. Well, that's cool. I've forgotten about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really cute. So, you know, you could use these florals, any of these florals, and combine them, or you can combine, you know, the paisley with the floral, and then this could be your sleeves. So, to me, this is that kind of fabric that can mix with a lot of things. Any, a lot of things. Anytime you mix black and white with anything, it just gives it a pop. I've learned that in interior design, actually. No matter what color scheme you're doing in your house, if you add black and white, it gives it a snap. I have bright green chairs and bright pink chairs in my house with a black and white ottoman. That's right. You had a good interior designer. I did. <laughs> okay, well, welcome. Thank you. All right, so this is the other color, another color of this soft plaid. I don't know why I'm calling it a plaid. Um, what do you call this? Is there a word for this? It's kind of a checkerboard. It's I mean, more like a checkerboard, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a beautiful blue, beautiful magenta. Both of these you can wear with black. You can wear with this. Yeah. And then this floral, very bright. This one is, I would say, um, this is viscose. This is, I can, I can actually see my ring through here. So there, it's not really sheer, but it's definitely a little sheerer than some of the others. So it's a different weight. Those look really good together. Mm -hmm. So that would be a nice combination. Yeah, I think somehow that side of the, both sides actually came together really well. Yeah. And what you could pair, I thought. Right. Aaron put the wall together and did a good job of uh, combining things. It's funny, there are, if you were to look at fabrics on a shelf, you don't look at them in the same way as when they're hung up. And that's what you can, you should be doing that with your stash, actually, getting them out maybe hanging them on hangers, putting them on a rack, putting them on a wall and really look at them. Or if, you have a, if you're a quilter, you probably have a working wall, you know, hanging the fabrics. It's interesting what goes together that you least expected. Now this is a very, very lightweight sweater knit. Um, so this is definitely gonna get, take you into fall. It's polyester and spandex. I love it because it looks like brush strokes and it looks great with this paisley. This is viscose. This is a tie-dye. Uh, we're seeing a lot more tie-dyes than we used to. And this is an interesting texture. It actually has the look of a ponte in its texture, surface texture, but it's not. And it's very drapey. So don't think of it as a ponte, but it's that kind of texture, which I know you can't see on the screen. And this is uh, Equivera and I, Echo Vera is rayon uh, that's uh, recycled, it's sustainable, all of that. So it's got that good quality to it. Love it with this. This can take you year round as well. And then another floral. So those are 10 of the, it's about a third of what we have on sale. And all of those are on the website uh, in the category of sale. So you can check out all the ones that are on sale. 50% off for the week. So, do we have any questions? We do. Um, 
Is it necessary to do a round back adjustment on a knit fabric? I usually add one and a half inches on a woven. Yes, I would do it on a knit as well. You're going to get the same drag lines in a knit that you're going to get on a woven, so I think it's a good idea to do it. Does the fusy web inhibit the stretch of the binding? The fusy web is just temporary glue. So it's first of all like a little sheer web and there's nothing about it that prevents any of the properties of knits. The stitching is going to prevent the stretching more than the fusy web. <laughs> so don't worry about that. What is the number of the 3 8 inch Bernina foot? Oh, mine is a clear foot and so I don't know the number, but it's the only clear foot that they have. What stitch length do you use? Well, now that's interesting. I'm glad you asked. Um, when I turn on my Bernina, the 2.5 is the standard stitch length that pops up in the machine. But no matter what I'm sewing, I always change it to a 2.4. Smaller stitch length, I'm going to have fewer problems with puckers, and it's a more quality stitch. A couple of questions about um, if you want to um, show the neck binding sample okay. there. Um, can you show the ripple of the band up close? Yeah, I don't know if you can see this. It's pretty, pretty subtle. Um, Point it out. There's another little section of ripple right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something about the okay. The, what's the wrong side of the sweater knit look like? I think it's just a nice uh, light gray which is the background of the piece. And you don't, there's no show through of the print, so you could use either side or both, combine them. That'd be fun. Um, how would you combine Paisley with the breaststroke fabric? Um, I see this as the main fabric and this as either binding That'd be a fun binding on that. I think rather than a full sleeve, I would do maybe a, a piece, a section, maybe a, a cuff-like addition to a sleeve, or maybe, maybe make a Maison type garment and do a band at the bottom in the Paisley. Whether you're <clears throat> making the Maison or not, you can always add a band to the bottom of a t-shirt. Uh, whether it's cinched in or not cinched in. I think that would look good. So I don't see this as a full sleeve, but I see it as uh, elements of addition. Can you show the underside of the neck band example? Sure. So this is, I've used this as an example for a, a few uh, <laughs> We'll show it over here because I've used the black. So the black thread is three thread surging, and I've cut the seam allowance down to about three eighths of an inch. Then you're also seeing the cover stitching stitching next to that. So I have a lot of thread in there, but it gives it a nice stable neckline. I know that I should be able to use my cover stitching well enough to cover the raw edge on the inside, but I'm not good enough to do that. So I go ahead and finish the inside of the neckline and cover stitch it as well. I learned that from the Bernina educator, Jamie David, in Kansas City. She taught me that, and I think she's right about that. Just go ahead and finish it and then do whatever uh, trim stitching you're going to do. Someone said the fit on your shirt today is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I don't wear things that have shape very often. <laughs> I like things to be really big. I don't see 
see any other questions. Okay. okay. All right. Well, grab your So Confident uh, kit for the month of September for the Florence Classic shirt. Be sure and join us in Cleveland. We'd love to see you there. We can make some knit clothes, make a whole knit wardrobe. We've got plenty of time to make lots of things. And then we have fabrics, 50% off, knit prints, a select group of knit prints, 50% off. And we also have a tutorial called Sewing Fashion Knits that's on sale. I think that tutorial is like 70 some pages long. It's a PDF and it has all the tips and tricks that I've talked about plus a lot more. So it's a, it's a good one. It's, it's one of those ones you want to print off and put in a notebook and keep. Of course, these young people are going, notebook? Who does that? But I do, and I like that. I like a printed reference. It's like a book. Uh, is that everything? That's on sale? Okay. I think so. Okay. All right. Well, we will see you next week. Uh, thank